So uh, a show full of intelligent, informed Christians. I know that's that's not right, is it, for Christmas time and Canadian television? We should have caricatures here, people who, who just scream a lot. A whole feature on the West Brass so-called Baptist Church and, and, the, and their vicious homophobia and misanthropy. No, that's all redundant, gratuitous, irrelevant. Instead, we're speaking about various aspects of Christmas. And how about those people who say, well, even if there was a Jesus and he was born a couple of thousand years ago, it's all nonsense and we shouldn't believe and we can be, we can be good without God and right and wrong are all human constructs. And, hmm, interesting. Dr. Andy Bannister, and it's a real PhD actually, Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. I say that because, look, I have to be completely honest, there are people mm. uh, the world over, but particularly in some evangelical circles, and they say they're doctor, and you look into their PhD, and it's not a real, it's an honorary doctorate or exactly. it's from a little college. You it, got yours from a real place and it took you years. Royal University took me, took me seven years, oh, exactly. You stupid. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's what I, thought. I think that's what my wife said, actually. <laughs> I threatened to do another one and she gave me a look, so yeah. No, it's important there. to say that because um, my oldest, our oldest son, is uh, starting his PhD very soon and it's after the BA and then the oh. MA and you're a teaching assistant and then years of study. It is a long time. Yeah, long I resent it when people, you know, pretend that, anyway, beyond that, most of your work, and Ravi Zacharias is a great man, a wonderful philosopher and theologian. It's reaching out to people who maybe have never even thought about the mm -hmm. idea of what life means and, 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 and what is good and what is evil, and maybe there is something more important than just our fleshy existence. You deal with atheists a great deal of the time. What Absolutely. would you say to the average Canadian person, maybe not a militant atheist, but just said, yeah, it's a nice time, but I, I mean, Christmas so, you know, it doesn't mean anything. There's no right and wrong. There's no good and bad. Just be nice to people when you can. There's no God. It's an interesting question, isn't it, Michael? Because I think one of the things I've sort of realised across the years is there are, last few years, there's almost sort of two versions of atheism going around now, mm. right now. There's the Richard Dawkins of this world who are like the sort of pit bull terrier yep. of atheism. But then there's the average sort of Canadian who's like the sort of a the sort of a not tested on animals, cuddly, friendly, sort of unicorns and rainbows kind of atheist who thinks that you can do away with, with Christianity, with God, and then you can live the nice life. Yeah, and we can, well we, put, can, we can all get along with each other. Yeah. And I think my, my answer always to that person, well, I answer a number of ways, but one of them is to say this, that's a very new form of atheism. I think if you read a little bit wider in philosophy, you will find atheist writers who are not the kind of vitriolic type of Dawkins. I think of people like Bertrand Russell from a generation or so ago, mm. who were willing to admit that if you remove God, with that go some foundations. I mean, if I come along to my house and I knock the foundations out and I say I don't need them, well, before long, I'm gonna find the thing collapsing around my ears. And I think the problem is so much of what we hold dear here in Canada, in the West, is actually, whether we like it or not, founded upon the Christian worldview. I mean, mm. human rights, for example, but treating each other with respect and dignity, that assumes that you are actually worthy of respect and dignity. But of course, on a purely scientific reading of things, I could say, well, Michael, you're just a collection of chemicals. Mm. You're just a series of biological processes in an organic sac. Why do you have intrinsic worth? Well, the answer is that human rights, if you trace it back to its origin, yeah. has always been founded on that Christian idea, that Ju Jewish and Christian idea, that you and I and, and every human being is made in the image of God, is of infinite value and worth, and therefore deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. And that lies at the heart of all that we hold dear here in the West. And I think the idea that you can just throw out the uh, religious component, inverted commas, and keep the rest is a mistake. Mm. That is very well put. And the distinction you draw between the, the professional hardcore atheists mm. who think they're very tough and challenging, although it's interesting that Dawkins and others won't debate with certain people. No. They like to debate with those they know are not the most rounded and formed of scholars, but uh, William Lane Craig, for example, who is a very impressive guy to argue with. Oh, absolutely. With, and Dawson simply won't, uh, won't debate with him in public. It just abuses him in private, writes, writes articles saying, he's not worthy of me. Well, if he's not worthy, take him on. But most people are not militant about anything. They just, there's a, there's a passive atheism. They're not really sure. You mentioned Bertrand Russell, whose papers, by the way, are at um, McMaster in Hamilton. That's right, that's uh, right. He was a great man. He was a, a, a highly intelligent, honest man who said, you know, the idea of removing God completely, that there are some moral consequences that could be troubling. And I respect the honesty there. I think if someone's willing to do that, whereas I think someone like, I mean, it's interesting you mentioned Dawkins and, and William Lane Craig. I think one of the problems there was that, of course, Dawkins, if you read what he has said, is he refuses to debate this Christian philosopher because, quote, it will look good on his resume and not on mine. Yeah. But then Dawkins goes out and debates these tiny little pastors from churches with no, with no philosophical credentials, knowing yeah. he can beat them up and it look good to his support base. Yeah. And what I respect about Russell and others, and a few today, I have atheist friends who yeah. I respect for the same reason. Those who are actually willing to say, look, atheism has some consequences, and they may be fairly unpleasant uh, mm -hmm. consequences. I mean, I was, and some of that is actually profound. I mean, I was, I was debating an atheist uh, friend on, on Twitter of all places the, the other day, and it was interesting. We got to a point at the end 
where he left the he ended the debate and walked away from it with this little quote where he said, you know, I just find it tragic. He said that more knowledge seems to lead to misery, hmm. and I and I and I poked him gently and I said, if that's your worldview, you need to think, ask yourself some hard questions. If you've concluded as an atheist that all we are left with is reason and reason ultimately leads to misery. That's, uh, I find that tragic because I believe in Jesus Christ who said the truth will set you free. That's a, a seminal point to make actually. If you, if you look at the, uh, the support, I mean, loath as I am to, to use the idea of the Second World War as being typical, mm. but it's important to remember what happened. If you look at the support for the Nazi party, it was highest amongst academics and students. It was lowest amongst farmers and the peasant class. They, I suppose it, it, was, it was growing with, with nature, knowing, understanding how the world really worked, and they thought this was a strange idea to have, the superiority of one race over another. They didn't embrace it, but the students who had years of education were extremely active. That's yeah, I and mean, there's an argument that says, and you have to be careful how you frame it, because yeah. if people just hear the soundbite, they, they, they think that you're a dribbling religious lunatic, that, you know, pure... I am. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, pure, I think pure, unadulterated reason disconnected from other things is extremely dangerous. I mean, mm. if you look at, this, at the project Stalin had, I mean, he's the example I often use, the state-sponsored state atheism and the way yeah. he wanted to reform society. He had this vision of what society should be like, built on cold, hard reason. And if people didn't fit, they were broken. Now, what he'd lost is he'd lost the value of humanity, he'd lost emotion, he'd lost spirituality. You take those things out, mm. you're in a very dangerous place. Reason is vitally important. Of course it is. And, and I know people will say, now, well, yes, of course, Stalin. Hitler and Pol Pot and Mao, and, and they may have been atheists, some would argue they weren't, but they were. But all the crimes committed in the, in, in the name of Christianity, my response has always been, yes, but if you read the primary text, the sacred books, the central works of Christianity, all, that, all of that was committed in contradiction of, in spite of what was written. Yes. Whereas if you read the, the holy books, if you like, of communism and fascism, the violence and horror was committed specifically because of that. Well, I think there are two issues going on. I mean, one is exactly, I mean, I'm, I'm perhaps slightly more gentle than, than, than you, but I go towards that end of things. Let's say when I've, I did a lot of teaching before I moved to Canada and Eastern Europe, and when you've seen what happened there, when you've sat and talked with people who mm. were not allowed to go to school because they were Christians, and to go, that's a, that's a very hard, uh, it's a very hard form of atheism that mm. I think Dawkins tries to brush aside. But the other thing I think you can say is this. I love your point there on, the, on what the texts actually say. But the thing is, if you as a follower of Jesus or myself as a follower of Jesus, if my atheist friend, our atheist friend, catches us going out and stealing from Tim Hortons or treating a colleague with disrespect, the thing is they can hold us to a standard. They can accuse you of being a hypocrite. And the problem is an atheist can never actually be, be, be accused of that because mm. there's no moral standard. There is no outside criteria to which they subscribed. And to return to Stalin for a moment, I think one of the most interesting questions that was ever put to another atheist, uh, Chris Hitchens, uh, who sadly died uh, mm. tragically young. I quite liked Christopher as I, an individual. I very much the person. Um, he, uh, he, debated, uh, he debated a pastor down in the, in the US a few years ago, uh, Douglas Wilson. And in that, in that debate, in the Wilson-Hitchens debate, the point that Wilson made that I think landed the most strongly on Hitchens was he looked at Hitchens and he said, he said, Christopher, tell me, if you were faced with Joseph Stalin on his deathbed, what would you say to him to help to convince him, to show him that the life that he had lived had been wrong on your atheism? Mm. How would you make him realize that what he'd done was not appropriate? And Chris could not answer that question. He ducked and he weaves and he danced. You see, Christians, you can accuse us of hypocrisy. You can hold us to the standard of Jesus Christ mm. if we're not living up to that. If we had more time, uh... Merry Christmas, thank and you. And Merry Christmas to you.